Welcome to season two of the story of a woman. I'm Nicola Barito. In this season, we continue our focus on incredible Caribbean women who have effected change in some form or fashion. I wish we could do every one of you because I believe every woman is amazing and phenomenal in her own right. But for now, we'll focus on those who we can. Women in the arts, history, culture, finance, leadership, the environment, women who fight for equality, inclusion, and the list goes on. Allow me to introduce a woman, along with her foundation partner, who has considerably made a valuable contribution to black and missing persons. Natalie Wilson is a part of the Black and Missing Foundation. Natalie, thank you so much for joining us. Your background is Caribbean. Tell us a little bit about that. Well, I was born in Trinidad, Princess Town um, in Trinidad. Um, I came to Washington, D.C. or America um, at the age of nine, um, my brother and I. We lived with my grandmother and when she passed away, you know, I, I think most Caribbean kids, a lot of Caribbean kids live with their, their grandparents. And when she passed, we came to America or DC to live with our um, mother. And then after that, um, I went to Winnipeg to live with my aunt and her family, my uncle and their children, came back to DC and, um, you know, have been in the DC area ever since. Natalie, the Black and Missing Foundation, was there a defining moment and was there any connection to your upbringing in Trinidad and Tobago? Well, the inspiration behind the Black and Missing Foundation is a young lady by the name of Tamika Houston, and she went missing from my sister-in-law's hometown of Spartanburg, South Carolina. And we read how her family, particularly her aunt, who's in media relations, she really struggled to get media coverage, particularly national media coverage. And a year later, Natalie Holloway went missing. And I'm sure you know exactly who Natalie Holloway is. And, you know, we decided to do some research because we definitely didn't see black and brown people who were in the news when they were reported missing. And we found that 30% of all persons missing were of color at the time. So my sister-in-law and I decided, well, why not us? Why don't we use our professions, our experience to highlight this issue and to help find and bring missing people home? And what I wanted to do was to use my background in PR or media relations, really as the publicist for these families, um, and to make them household names as well, because awareness is key. If the community isn't aware that someone is missing, then they aren't doing anything about it. And publicity also adds pressure to law enforcement to add resources to the case. And thinking about my background, I left Trinidad when you know, I was very young, but I always remember my uncle saying, you talk too much. <laughs> I think, you know, me always, you know, chatting or just chatting it up, maybe, you know, helped <laughs> with my background in, in public relations. Natalie, we all want a happy ending, even if it means closure. Tell us about the success rate of the foundation. How do you measure that? Well, when we first started the organization, we said that if we can just bring one person home, we did our job. And close to 14 years later, we have provided answers or closure or help find close to 400 people. And we can do so much more if we had the community involvement so we can build our team and bring more people home. It's really frustrating. It's really disheartening, you know, pounding the pavement with these families, trying to get media coverage or law enforcement assistance. But we can't give up on these families because many times we are their last resort. And that's what 
motivates us to keep going. These families are desperate. They have nowhere to turn to. And it could be my family member. It could be me. It could be anyone that I know. And I would want someone to help us through this process to work alongside us to help find our missing loved one. And I'm also keeping my eyes on my home, Trinidad. And a lot of the Caribbean nations, they have an issue of missing people as well. And the stories of missing young girls and boys, they're escalating, they're growing, and they're very horrific. So something that we're keeping in mind for future you know, expansion is um, satellite offices in, you know, maybe in Trinidad or Grenada or um, Jamaica, some of the Caribbean islands that we believe that can use our support and I want to give back to my home. Natalie, was there any sort of culture shock for you? And let me be specific. You mentioned Natalie Holloway and the sort of exposure that her disappearance got. I mean, media coverage across the globe as opposed to Tamika Houston, whose family had such a difficult time getting exposure, re her disappearance. Uh, was that difficult for you? Was it a slap in the face when you realized that race played a major role? You know, when we first started the organization, to be quite honest with you, we had no idea of the magnitude of the issue. And to learn that 30% of the population of missing people, of people of color, yet you don't see that represented in the news or with law enforcement. It was, it was a, a culture shock. And as you dig deeper, you find that there's so many systemic issues why the person is reported missing. You know, mental health, domestic violence, um, sex trafficking. And, and to be quite frank, there's some people that are wandering away from their lives for whatever reason. And especially with our children, we need to figure out what are they walking away from and ultimately what are they walking into? Because we know that within 24 to 48 hours of being on the street, so many of them are propositioned for sex. And think about it, they have to survive. So what are they going to do or how are they going to survive? And these predators know that. Natalie, what is the relationship like with the families who come to you and your sister-in-law, well, your foundation partner, those families who come to you to find their, their missing loved ones? Is it difficult to not get emotionally attached? With all of these cases, we see ourselves in these cases because it could be any one of us. And we want these families to know that we are working and walking alongside them. We know that they're frustrated and oftentimes they wanna give up, but we hold their hands and we're giving them the resources that they need to find their missing loved one so that they can hang on for another day. It, it is, it's weary at times, even for us. And for me, how I get grounded and I don't give up is I listen to my Calypso music and it just helps me to, you know, like, okay, you'll be okay. I'm listening, I'm crying. And I'm like, okay, you know what? I'm West Indian, I can do this. I, I can't give up. And I think about my grandmother, I think about my ancestors and I just know that I will be okay. So, you know, that's how I, I, I keep going and that's how I, hold on to strength for these families because they become our family. I mean, many times they call us, we don't even get a word in, we're listening to them as they cry or they're frustrated or they're tired and we're you know, just listening. And there are times when we have to spring into action to help them. So it's, it's, it's just a labor of love, it really is. Your toughest and biggest hurdle the biggest hurdle is changing the mindset. So changing the mindset of the media, whether their biases are intentional or not, but their biases in not covering these stories are really impacting the recovery of these missing individuals, you know, law enforcement, their biases when they stereotype a child as a runaway, 
or a missing person of color being involved with some type of criminal activity, it really impacts the case and the urgency, the sense of urgency and resources that you know, can help solve it. And even with our community, you'll be surprised. We've been sounding the alarm about this pandemic for close to 14 years, but members of our community don't believe that it's happening. They don't believe that sex trafficking is happening <laughs> you know, in our backyards. So again, it's changing that mindset and we've come a long way, but we still have more work to do. Your greatest achievement. Oh my gosh, I, I don't think I've done it yet. Um, we still have a lot, a lot of work to do. We're just scratching the surface. So we have gotten accolades, but we haven't... I don't have my greatest achievement as far as this organization yet. We still have a lot of work to do. There are thousands of people that are missing that we still need to bring home or at least provide answers, closures, families. Okay, Natalie, I, I have to bring it to the fore, even if you're not going to talk about it. Tell us about the L'Oreal Women of Worth nomination. To be nominated alongside nine other phenomenal women who are doing, you know, work, they're on the ground doing the work, trying to bring about change, you know, to be noticed and to be recognized for your work, it is a great accomplishment to be, you know, selected um, as a L'Oreal honoree, but the work continues. We're grateful for the visibility. Um, there were so many people who hadn't heard about the organization um, outside of that L'Oreal, um, you know, award, but it's still so much work to be done. So I'm grateful for the honor. I'm grateful that we were able to get a grant that can help us help so many more families. But like I said, we're just scratching the surface and we got to, you know, dig deeper and, and these families you know, we're all that they have and we have to help them. So it's not about me and, and it's hard to talk about me, and, you know, the accolades, it, it really isn't. Um, it's about these families because I can envision, you know, I, it could be any one of my, my relatives that could be going through this. Let's talk about the HBO docu-series. If you're not gonna mention it, I am. I mean, working alongside Soledad O'Brien. You know what? We were grateful to Soledad O'Brien, a veteran in the news industry, in production. And she put together a phenomenal team of women. Um, there were a few men, um, you know, just to give a bird's eye view of the challenges that we face in getting media coverage and law enforcement assistance for the families. And really you come alongside us as we try to solve some of these cases. And the reception has been amazing to the docu-series. Um, we were even nominated for two awards. One is the NAACP award for directing, best director, and um, the Spirit Award. And how amazing is that to be recognized? Um, and for Soledad and the community to take notice of the work that we're doing. And she also wants to use her voice and her platform to highlight this issue. So we're very grateful for that opportunity. Um, and, you know, we hope to keep the momentum going to continue to provide this HBO um, platform as an outlet for other stories. So, you know, we'll see what happens. As a Black woman in America, and a West Indian woman at that, inclusion, diversity, racism, uh, all of the above, what does Natalie Wilson want? What do you want to achieve, especially uh, for women like us looking on who are inspired by you? You know, I, I do this. I want my grandmother, I want my, <clears throat> my uncle to be proud of me. Oh, 
I am Caribbean and it gives me strength. And there are days when I doubt myself, but I know that I come from greatness. Oh, Natalie. You know, I, I was um, in Trinidad in 2018. <clears throat> and I went back to where I grew up from, from nothing. But we had love, we had food, we had encouragement. And to know that I've come this far, anybody could do it. Just have the right people, the right, support system and believe in yourself. God has given you everything that you need to accomplish your dreams. And you got to listen to yourself and your intuition. But I just want my grandmother and my uncle to be proud. I feel your pain. Because my uncle, <clears throat> he, he sacrificed his life for us. You know, my mother was a single mother and he always wanted to move back home but he didn't because he wanted us to be successful and um hope he's proud thank you natalie this has been the story of a woman natalie wilson especially not for one little black girl whose disappearance shook the dc community and the nation, Relisha Rudd. We will never stop searching for you, for all of you, and for answers. <clears throat> I said I wasn't gonna cry, and I'm not. On behalf of the Black and Missing Foundation, thank you, Beverly Bond, Deborah Lee, and BT, for this amazing opportunity. It is such a pleasure to be here. For close to 10 years, we have been sounding the alarm about our missing black and brown women, men, and children who do not get the Amber Alert, they don't get the coverage, they don't get the law enforcement resources. It's time for us to keep it real. Thank you to our partners. We are Ashley Furniture Home Store Antigua, and One Caribbean Television. So I say this to say in terms of your legacy and the issues and challenges that you face and your success, because you're successful, your impact is, mm -hmm. is it's resounding. And you are out here doing what you do best and you know, we just really want to applaud you. And my, my reason for reaching out to you is because I think that your influence is so positive that we just need to get you to tell your story and to enhance the younger women, the younger girls who are looking on, even the women, the mature women like ourselves, who, you know, they don't have that platform or they can't identify with anything. So, okay, let's use ourselves as an example. There was a time when we were the you know, the popular girls, the kind of it girls, you know, the girls the guys liked and, and that type of thing. So we, we've, I think, been on every side of the coin, to be honest, where, you know, everybody wanted to be around you or wanted to be in your space because of who you were and who you knew and, and where you were and that type of thing. We've also been in, in situations where it's been the total opposite. It's because of who you are and because of where you've been, they don't want anything to do with you or even people saying, Oh, she's just a pretty girl. She has no value. She's not gonna, she can't read the news. She can't, yep. you understand what I'm saying? And, and again, just deciding for you what your fate and what your destiny should be. And again, in very similar respects, you've come from some of the greatest situations in, in perspective, huh? People yep. just, perspective and perception. Let me just say that first. That perspective and perception become people's truths, no matter what you say. So even self me saying to you that all the people that I love 
hurt me in some way, shape, or form, and, and sometimes continue to do so. The average person would believe that. Now they're gonna be looking at everybody and looking at their picture. Oh, look, she love Nicola. Is Nicola who's your chief? You know, you know what I mean. But it's just, it's just again perception yes. and and how people. So okay, same thing. You understand what I'm saying? You've been in some of the greatest situations that people would ever say, "Wow, she got to do this," and you walked away from it because it wasn't fulfilling or you weren't respected or any, enough and you weren't willing to be a puppet and you weren't willing to sacrifice your morals you weren't listen i've had every opportunity to be on every pretty much every radio station a part of every sound and because they wanted to make me be like them versus like me i've turned those things down thank you no thank you you understand what thank I'm you saying? for the opportunity yes yes but you understand and, and that is when you truly believe in yourself and you truly believe in your ability. I, I don't want to say talent because when you say talent, people always think it has to be on TV or radio or so. Your ability, whatever your ability is. If your ability is to be the greatest clean in the world, that's your ability that nobody can take away from you. If your ability is to be the greatest sex worker in the world, nobody can take away that ability. Everybody, no matter what you choose to do in this life, if I, I'll tell you how like how my father said, if you want to be a janitor, you want to be a doctor or a lawyer, be the best. Got it. That's it. Yeah, that is a fact. Because it takes so many of us, it takes all of us to make up this world. Somebody has to do it. We look down on people, and I say we because I know that at some point in time we may be guilty of it, at, even if it's a, yes. a little bit. And then some of us, we have to check ourselves, you know, like. Okay, so yeah. for example, that, that person, the same person who, when you was at the job or you were at the gig, tried to sabotage you. When you see that it turn around and bite them. Oh God, a little part of you as a human just say, mm hmm yep. And so it continues. And then you have to say, you know what? No, let me leave them. Leave God is the boss. Leave it alone. You understand? Yep, yep. But again, even being public people, like people don't understand the levels of scrutiny, of scrutiny that we go, go through. So even if let's say, for example, you lost your job or you, you get cut from a gig, what you going through personally is one thing. Then what the public tries to put you through is, is a, a whole totally other. Totally different world. So, you know, I always tell people that the ones who like to sit back and criticize, to a certain degree, I consider them cowards. For the simple reason that, would you do what I do? Would you be willing to put yourself on the front line or go to a radio station? Not necessarily know what to do, but just having a passion and people calling you, shut up, you talk too much, you're too loud, you're too dark, you're too light, your hair too short, your hair too... Could you go through that and keep on trucking? And every time they see a smile, could you do that? Until you could tell me that you could do that safely, consistently, then you, your voice doesn't really matter to me. Yeah, it doesn't. At the end of you the know, day. and a lot of us go through that, and I hope that for my peers, both male and female, because again, you know, we tell our story as women because we are based on emotion. You understand? So we are able to express ourselves in a certain way and on a certain level. A man is stifled when it comes to that, especially a Caribbean man, because strength, when you cry as a Caribbean man or you express yourself, you're weak. You understand? You're weak. Right, exactly. But you know, so many things. So, so many of my peers as well suffer from so many anxiety things, so many, you know, insecurity issues that they can't show and sometimes makes them in interact and react poorly. So, let me just say that in their defense is that so many of the people that we may give a really hard time in the industry, especially our male figures and our females as well. But let me, let me just deal with the men and I'm going to deal with the ladies after. With the men in particular, ease them up ease them up you don't know what it's like you don't know what it's like to have to get up every day whether they feel good or not think about a woman on her cycle regardless of whether we have it or not we have to come here and smile oh. <laughs> nobody wants to do that i want to lay in my bed but i do that and i do that for you and i do that to let you know as, as well as myself that we are strong we can get through this and if i could do this then then i could do anything a lot of these fellas are under unnecessary pressure. And like I say, it makes them react poorly within their environments and sometimes within society. Let's be a little less harsh on the judgment. You know what I mean? I think that's killed a lot of people. A lot of people who've, who've taken their lives, like I say, both in our, in our diaspora as well as throughout the world, is for that because they're afraid of being judged. And we are not here to judge anyone. We're not. We're not. But we don't recognize I am that. perfectly. Perfect. I and, I, that and I say cheers to that. All the time. <laughs> you understand? I don't try to be anybody else or anything else but me. 
I'm good with me. If you're not good with me, then you deal with that on your time. I'm good with me. And I can, I can safely say that about everything that I done. God forbid the father was to take me away today. I could say yes. I think all the people that I love know that I love them. I think my message of passion and love for my people and my culture, I think that's pretty straightforward and, 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 and understood at this point. I don't feel like whether they love me or they don't love me or whether they like me or they don't like me or they respect me or they don't respect me, I think they all fully understand that, yeah, she's a real one, you know? And I, I'm cool with that. My son thinks the world of me and, I, and, you know, that's the important thing for me. People always ask me, you know, oh, you know, you, what, you should, they say things like, you know, I should be more involved in social media and I should advertise more and I should do this. I feel at this stage in my life, if you really want to be me, be, be, when I'm not, be with me or around me or a part of me or anything that I do, you know where to find me. Yeah. You, will be. you know, so I tell people, not that I discredit in promotion and thing, you know, I'm just saying that at this stage, it's like me. You know, you know, you, okay, and let's just use this as an example. God forbid something was to happen to you right now, whether this was a great moment or a bad moment for you. There's somebody that's on your speed dial and every time something happens great to you or bad to you, that's the person that you call, mm -hmm. right? Whether you talk every day or not, that's the first person that you call. So I consider myself that person. Wonderful. So I don't have to fight up or, or beat up. And like I say, the people that I, once the people that I love and respect are proud of me, I'm cool with that. this whole concept that women don't support women, that uh, we have this nature of being very catty and very underhanding against each other, especially in, in the workplace. I think in many instances, that's unfair. I am woman. Hear me roar in numbers too big to ignore. Yes. I've paid the price. If I have to, I can do anything. I am woman. Here at West Indies Oil, we recognize the contribution that women make to our country and our society as a whole. And therefore, we'll continue to provide opportunities for women to play key roles in the growth and success of this company.